This is a Tesla Model 3. Now, here's the thing. I love car reviews, but the problem with them is that most reviewers have only spent a couple of hours or days with the car before they review it. And everyone knows that car ownership goes a lot deeper than that. I've been driving this Tesla Model 3 Performance for about a year now. I've had a lot of great experiences with it. I've had some not so great, and I wanna talk about it. It's pretty difficult to review a car without talking about the design language of the vehicle. And while the ultra minimalist interior of the Model 3 has been uh, pretty controversial, the exterior is more objectively beautiful. Tesla designer Franz von Holzhausen worked really hard on making this car look sporty and aggressive without being too overbearing or impractical. You have this nice curved design on the front, which is a little Porsche-esque, but then you get these really firm, sharp lines that continue out through the length of the vehicle and really matches the rest of Tesla's lineup. Making cars is pretty difficult, or so Tesla would lead you to believe. You see this vehicle right here? This is a July 2018 model, which puts it basically right in the middle between now, when this review is being published, and when Model 3 production first began. Now, the earliest Model 3s had a lot of problems. Paint issues, panel misalignment, enormous body gaps, general quality control problems. This and newer vehicles have improved in this department, but they are still not at the level of a traditional automaker. You see, I have problems. My first two doors, they're not equally aligned. I can see paint on the inside on the driver's side, but not on the passenger side. Steel, aluminum, plastic. You see, they use different materials in the construction of the body panels to save weight. Aluminum, which is the most abundant, and also one of the lightest, is a problem because it dents with such ease it would blow your mind. I dropped a folding chair 10 inches onto the body panel and I didn't think anything of it. Oh, it's fine. No, it dented and aluminum is very difficult to repair. But that's not the only problem. The paint, which covers the metals and plastics, of course, is total garbage. My very expensive paint job, which is now free, by the way, thanks a lot, Elon, uh, is one of the worst paint jobs I've ever seen on any car ever. The cheapest, most economy cars have a better paint job than this. It's uneven, the clear coat is bad, it's thin, it chips hyper easy, it is garbage. Get the free color and spend some money on a wrap because the paint is just trash. Because there's no engine or traditional transmission in this car, there's a lot more space in the Model 3 than you might expect. If there's not enough room in the very spacious trunk for your liking, you can obviously fold down the back seats to get more bodies inside. You probably even fit a couple legs or two in here in this storage compartment, which again, is there because no transmission. There's even this tiny little pocket on the side, which probably fits more than a supercar. But if you're some kind of weirdo that needs even more space, there's always the frunk. That's right, front trunk. Again, no engine, only a motor about the size of a melon leaves you a lot of space up here. Now, opening the front trunk is, well, hold on now. I'm gonna go to the app, I'm gonna open the app, I'm gonna click front trunk, and then I'm gonna confirm. That's the reason why I don't use it that much. Unlike the back, where there's a button, like every car ever made, there's no button of any sort on here. You have to use the app or use the in-car display, which is very slow and inconvenient. And look, I mean, there's not a lot of storage up here, but certainly enough to fit groceries, and that's the reason for these hooks. If you ever get smelly takeout food, this is the place to put it. It's isolated from your cabin, it is water sealed, and it's a pretty good place to put stuff. Just not one I use with that much frequency. Put a button on it, on. The Model 3's most distinct feature is its interior. And the two most common criticisms I see are from people who clearly don't own the car because they say it's not built of good materials. And then they say that it is hyper minimalistic to being Spartan and dysfunctional. Now it's true that there are a lot of buttons that are not in this car. There's in fact, almost no buttons. Almost everything is removed and moved on to the in-screen display. And for some things that can be at times a little annoying, but if you think about it, your car has tons of buttons all over that you almost never, if have ever touched. This gets rid of that. In exchange for the dumb little buttons you never use, there is a ton of space. Not just from a field of view standpoint, because there's no dashboard, you can see the almost entire landscape, thanks to also the very steep nose cone, but you also get in exchange a ton of interior room. I have an entire garbage can in my center console, and it's because there's no buttons and no transmission in the way. It's super, super excellent. 
And the build quality of the materials is really good as well. I think this synthetic leather, AKA not leather, is some of the nicest synthetic leather I've ever felt in a car. And these front seats feel incredible. It almost reminds me of the 70s when cars were really unsafe because they're just super streamlined. It feels like you're on a couch. I can sit in these things for hours. When you're in the front, you have a lot of headroom thanks to the glass roof. And in the back, it really just depends. On the plus side, I'm nearly six foot four and my head doesn't touch this sloped roof, which is really nice. I will say, however, that because the seats are so low to the floor, thanks a lot battery pack, it almost feels like my knees are in my chest. It's fine for around town commutes, but for long distance travel, I'd get pretty uncomfortable. It's mostly suited for kids. Speaking of kids, they are going to love the panoramic sunroof which you as the driver will not because there's this big massive A-pillar. And I actually, when I'm driving the car, forget it's even there until someone gets in my car and goes, whoa. I really wish Tesla would have offered something like the panoramic roof on the Model X. That edge to edge bezel-less nature is something that I as the driver should be able to enjoy. Don't leave it to the kids. Now that Spartan interior really manifests itself when you're in the infotainment system. This was a change that was really difficult for me because where you have the tactility of, of buttons in a normal car, you basically have to look at the display on the Model 3, which at first feels a little dangerous, but once you learn the general areas in which items are located on the touchscreen, it really doesn't feel that much different from a button. A lot of the things that I liked to having in front of me on a heads up display are moved into this left column of the display, like your speedometer, the speed limit, your battery status and, and more. And at first I really didn't like it. It just was off center and it was a weird adjustment, but I've actually come to prefer it. Now, it is a little bit off to the right, but it's higher up on the horizon level. And so I actually find myself looking down less than I would in a normal car, therefore making my driving actually a little safer. There are some things that are still a little goofy, like having to access the glove box through the second menu or having to access the heated seats uh, through the climate menu and then through a secondary heated seat menu if you wanna uh, heat the back seats. But in general, things seem pretty well laid out. I do wish there was a little more customization. Tesla is constantly moving things around on the feedback that their kind of users give them, but it does mean that every once in a while there's a new learning curve to the UI and I can't just move these buttons to where I want. They are where they are and that's just how it is. Now, where Model 3 really excels is performance, and all electric cars, specifically Teslas, are well known for their rapid acceleration. This Model 3 performance is, <laughs> it's no different. It does zero to 60 and, well. Fuji. Acceleration is instant, which is truly unique to electric cars. It's almost a kind of you have to drive it to no scenario. I'm a big fan of a lot of internal combustion engine cars, but no matter how fast the ICE car, there's always a little bit of acceleration or, or input delay, whether that be from the turbo spooling up or the need to downshift, uh, even just a slight delay from pushing the pedal to making the engine go, that doesn't exist in a Tesla, in, in an electric vehicle. The second, no, the millisecond you push the pedal, you are instantly getting accelerative feedback. And it is truly unique and super, super fun. So sure, this car is fast, zero to 60, but where it really excels, where it really flies is the 40 to 60 or the 60 to 80, or those really quick bursts where you touch the pedal and you're just off. But any car buff will tell you that there is a lot more to driving dynamics than simple acceleration. And that's been a criticism, a valid one, against Tesla for a number of years because the Model S and the Model X handle like absolute boats. Now, those are heavy cars, but they had bad air suspension, the steering was vague, they were about as graceful as Talos of Tech using an Android phone long term. Now, the Model 3 changes this formula. It's still a heavy car at 4,100 pounds. That's as much as a Ford F-150 pickup truck. But what it does right is it's steel spring suspension instead of air suspension. Now, some may be quick to criticize the Model 3 for that, and, and many did because of a price segment that this car operates in, air suspension really should be an option, but it's not, steel only. The good thing though is that Tesla spared no expense and the steel suspension in this car is some of the best I've driven in any price point, period, let alone the price point that this car operates in. 
It truly is excellent. Uh, now, there is a bit of understeer, as with every car in this kind of mid-range luxury segment, but because the center of gravity is so low to the ground and the suspension is so superb, uh, you really have the ability to just hang in corners super easily. Even with these crappy all-season tires that I'm running right now, uh, there's just total and, and absolute grip on the road. Uh, does it handle as tightly as a BMW uh, M3? Well, no, but that's also a far more expensive car. It definitely handles better than a Mercedes C-Class, even E-Class, I think. And I think it handles as well as, uh, or if not better, than the BMW 3 Series, which to even be compared against that legendary car is a feat in and of itself. There's one other thing that makes driving so much easier. It's not just the steering wheel, which while electronic and feels a little bit vague, uh, it does provide feedback audibly. Because there's no engine in this car, you can hear the tires on the road. And so while you can't necessarily feel them like you can in other performance vehicles, uh, it, it's, it, it's a totally different experience. And it allows you to feel connected to the steering wheel, to the tires, and to the road without really having to feel it. It's, it's a bit unusual. Lastly, one pedal driving is a game changer. Because this car has regenerative braking, when you let off the accelerator, the gas pedal, it automatically slows down the car because it's regenerating the electricity that comes from the motors, pushing them back into the battery pack. But what this means is that you get excellent one pedal driving when you're in canyons. And this car feels hyper agile because the accelerator can be hyper feathered. Not only is it responsive to accelerate, but it's responsive to decelerate. And so there's no more playing with pedals and shifting your feet around. You just throw it into corners, you let off the pedal, you apply the pedal, and it just feels absolutely incredible. I'm not the only one to think this. Look at reviews across the board for Model 3 from a bunch of car blogs. The handling on this thing is absolutely insane. Autopilot, I'm not gonna talk about it. Now, isn't that one of the defining features of the car? Yeah, and that's why I'm not going to talk about it. Unlike the car's other capabilities, which are mostly static, Autopilot is continually evolving and improving over time. I did a video about Autopilot in December of last year. I showed off its capabilities and its limitations. Since then, things have improved a little bit. It can now navigate uh, a little bit better than it used to be able to before inside of lanes and handling merges. It can also semi-autonomously drive itself in a parking lot. Gimmicky, but fun. It will continue to improve over time, and that's why I'm not going to take time to talk about it, because it is a major reason why you should buy this car, but you should go watch a dedicated video on it. We talked about the infotainment system in passing, but it really requires a closer look, because something featured so prominently, well, we gotta talk about it, but what the display lacks in buttons, it makes up for in features. The user interface is continually evolving, and new features are added all the time. For example, Joe Mode, this guy on Twitter named Joe tweets Elon and says, hey, look, some of the notifications and, and chimes are a little bit too loud. Can you turn them down in the back seat so that it doesn't wake up my kid? Tesla says, sure, and adds a new Joe mode and pushes it out to their entire fleet. The system's not perfect. I mean, there are some bugs here and there, and I don't like that there's not much customizability. For example, this home link icon that used to be over on the left, which opens your garage, is now clear on the right. And it's too far for me and I don't like it, but I can't move that around. But all in all, I mean, it's such a minor complaint. In a market with historically awful infotainment systems, it's a really, really nice change. And getting updates every couple of weeks makes things even better. That's right, updates are frequent, they are free, and there's no trips to the dealership. They just happen, and they're amazing. New features are added, bugs are fixed, things improve. It's really unique and special. Uh, and it's created an experience that creates a bond between me and the car far more than I ever have with any car in the past. I used to get bored with cars. I'd drive them for a few months and you know they just kind of became normal. This car always keeps me on my toes and I'm always interested to see what happens. And when, when every update comes out, I'm like a kid on Christmas running downstairs to see what new features my car can do. It really is great. Navigation is important and it is excellent in the Tesla Model 3. It utilizes Google Maps and traffic data to do live rerouting, which is excellent. Uh, I have a traffic jam on the way home. Voice commands also use Google Voice and data search, which is excellent. And this is not unique to Tesla, but what is pretty unique as far as I'm concerned is excellent voice context clues. For example, I can say, navigate to Chick-fil-A near Sugar House Park. And I don't have to specify on screen which one. It knows the Chick-fil-A near Sugar House Park and navigates me there in one prompt. It's super, super excellent. 
Now, range is also helpful because it tells you how much battery you're going to have when you arrive, round trip, and it even shows you a trip meter, which accounts for elevation. So when you're going uphill, it knows that you'll consume more battery. And when you go downhill and regeneratively break, it accounts for that as well to give you a much more accurate description of how much juice you'll have when you arrive. Non-Tesla owners complain a lot about the absence of CarPlay and Android Auto. And a year ago, this bothered me, but now I really don't care. Navigation is excellent, and with native Spotify support, with TuneIn and radio streaming as well, and of course, Bluetooth audio if you want to fall back, I don't really feel like I'm missing that many features. Speaking of audio, the sound system is superb. It's one of the best I've heard in any car, period. The fact that it is the base or stock sound system is truly incredible. Now, the app is basically how everything is controlled on this car, and it, it looks and feels a little bit dated, but it still works really well. And you use your phone as a key, which at first was a weird adjustment, but I'll have a hard time ever going back. It's completely passive, it uses Bluetooth. You just pull the door handle, the car unlocks, you get in the car, you drive to your destination, you get out, and you walk away. There's no power button, there's no locking and unlocking, the phone just handles everything, and it is super nice. There are so many features that I can't cover in their entirety, like Sentry Mode, which records video when your car is sitting in a parking lot, watching and recording if people vandalize or bump into it. Some features are admittedly less useful, like the dozen or so Easter eggs. And some really show that Tesla designed this car for a future where autonomy would take control, and car passengers could play a video game or watch Netflix. But that's for a date far into the future. For now, Netflix, Hulu, and YouTube are handy when charging. All right, let's talk supercharging. I'm here at one of tens of thousands of supercharging stalls located around the world. Whether or not there's going to be one located near you geographically kind of just depends. Tesla's opening and building new stalls every day, but the supercharging network is becoming increasingly strained. I live in a city of about 2.2 million people. There are only 10 stalls inside the city, there are stalls on the outside of the city's limits, but in this location, these stalls are almost always slammed. This is the least crowded I've seen it in months. That's gonna become an increasing problem as Tesla continues to sell cars. They need to keep building chargers. Luckily, once you're at a charger, you're not going to be there for very long. You see, with current supercharging technology, V2, I can charge from zero to 80% on my Tesla Model 3 in about 25 minutes sometimes 30, depending on how crowded the station is. However, with new V3 technology, which is coming very soon, you'll be able to get 75 miles of range in just five minutes. That is, I think, kind of the godsend. That's where Tesla needs to get to bring down the number of locations that they need and the time actually spent charging. Practically speaking, what does this mean? Well, expect to have to stop for a few minutes every once in a while on long distance trips. From Salt Lake City to Los Angeles, a trip that normally takes 12 hours, I had to stop to charge for about 70 minutes total, a little over 13 hours total. That's a long time to wait and charge, but at the same time, I would have taken that time to go to the bathroom and eat meals anyway. So it's not that much more, but it is a change in pace. You are gonna have to change the way that you travel with a car like this. Furthermore, the supercharger network doesn't yet reach all of North America, almost, but not quite. My grandparents live in Calgary, Alberta, and I truly cannot get to them in this car, at least not if I'm going to charge at the supercharger, because in Helena and rural Montana, they're just not finished being built yet. But worrying about how long you're going to be stuck at the supercharger or about range anxiety really isn't that rational because you're not spending your time at the supercharger. You're spending your time doing other stuff because you're charging at home or at work. I do the latter. I come to the office, I get here in the morning, I plug my car in, and when I leave, I have a full battery. I look at my battery meter on my Tesla less than I ever looked at my fuel tank because I just always have juice. It's really hard to say how much it costs to drive an electric car because that greatly depends on where you're located. Here, where I charge, it's about 22 cents per kilowatt hour. Not super cheap, and yet it really only costs me about $4 to fill up my tank, and I just do it from the comfort of my own office. It's pretty nice. All right, it's time to talk about the dirty, the topic that many Tesla detractors will go on and on and on about, battery degradation. So, is it a real thing? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> these are batteries and batteries do degrade. 
Now, the rate at which they will degrade really depend on a lot of different factors, like how high you typically charge the battery, your driving habits, your climate that you live in, extreme hot and extreme cold, don't typically play very nicely with battery packs. And then like the silicon lottery with CPUs, honestly, just luck. Now to give Tesla credit, they do a lot more than say your iPhone at managing and taking care of the battery pack. There are advanced systems that maintain ideal temperatures and cycles. These things run for days even after your car hasn't been driven. It's a constant process to reduce the rate at which the battery degrades. So I've had my car for 21,000 miles and one year. How much has the degradation been? Drum roll please, 2%. 2% is not nothing. And over the course of five years and 100,000 miles, it's going to be more than 2%. It'll probably be about 10. Now, unlike an internal combustion engine, your fuel tank doesn't get smaller the more you drive it. That's unique to electric vehicles. And that can, depending on how much you need that extra range in your battery pack, a bit of a downside. But the degradation is so minor that really you're gonna have problems with other components on Tesla vehicles before the battery pack. In 25 years, are you gonna see a 2018 Model 3 driving around? Probably not as much as we see 1995 Ford Taurus is driving around today. But if you're buying the car new, that is a problem so far into the future that you probably don't need to worry about it. So, is the Tesla Model 3 the perfect car? No, but it has been really reliable. It's actually dependent on the trim level, you get pretty good value. Driving it is a blast, and I'm gonna have a hard time going non-electric in the future. And then autopilot, continues to improve with every month and it's exciting to know that my car will get better over time well if you enjoyed this video please give it a like if you didn't that other button works okay too thank you so much for watching though and as always stay snazzy see you later folks